So once you start looking at this information at this level, you begin to get a picture of uh, basically criminal activity by the very people who are charged with protecting investors from such criminal activity. And that's kind of one aspect of 9-11, and you look at all the varying levels of the story we've been told, the story doesn't fit to go to, for example, the official conspiracy theory. One example, I mean, most of you, I'm assuming now, most of you are not new to this again. How many of you are new to this information entirely? All right, maybe instead of me talking, maybe we'll just do a Q&A and I can answer some of your questions. Um, are there any questions? Good cool story. Um, on 9-11, there are a lot of people, really important people, having a lot of really interesting breakfast meetings. Uh, so you have General Mahmoud Ahmed is the uh, Pakistani general who's the head of the ISI. The ISI is the Pakistani equivalent of our CIA. He's here on state visit the week of 9-11, ostensibly discussing terrorism. So he's at breakfast with Bob Graham and Porter Goss. At the time, these were the respective heads of the Senate and House Intelligence Committees. Now, after 9-11, uh, General Ahmed goes back to Pakistan. Finally retired. Well, the Times of India publishes a report that states that Ahmed had ordered a wire transfer of $100,000 to Lee Hijack Muhammad Atta. The FBI subsequently confirms this report. And yet, General Ahmed is never called to testify. And if you search the 9 11 Commission report, you will see no mention of Mr. Ahmed or the Pakistani connection to terrorism financing. You'll also see no mention of any connection or any possible connection between the Saudis and terrorism finance. And yet prior to 9-11, if you go back actually before the Bush administration, you had FBI agent Robert Wright, who was in charge of an operation called a Boulder Betrayal. As Paul Thompson writes and tells the story, he says there's a certain irony here, because his investigation, he was looking at sources of terrorism finance, and he met with resistance all down the line. In fact, he stated that his supervisor told him he was not to go for criminal prosecution of any of the people that they were conducting surveillance on. And he was looking at, for example, uh, a particular Saudi named Yasin al Qadi, who just recently in the news, we have a story that certain foreign governments have frozen Yasin al Qadi's assets. And yet, Robert Wright was on that trail 12 years ago. So why is it, and this is something that repeats throughout um, the researchers who have looked into this, if you look at their work, this is a pattern that repeats. You have numerous whistleblowers who were trying to either, for example, they were conducting surveillance on Islamic, young Islamic men trained in flight schools in the country. Their investigations are obstructed, they're pulled off the case. Robert Wright's investigation was shut down in 2000. John O'Neill's investigations were obstructed. Only Rowley, with the Minneapolis office of the FBI, had uh, tried to obtain a FISA warrant to look at the records on Saudi's computer prior to 9-11. Well, there were people in headquarters who altered lapses. Uh, there's a reporter in New York named Jane Stanley who's standing in front of the glass window with Lauren Manhattan behind her. And Building 7 was also known as the Solomon Brothers Building. Uh, the scroll, the anchor in London, and the uh, news person in New York are basically discussing how Building 7 has collapsed, and yet it's standing there behind her. And there are several curious things about that clip. First, uh, about, for one thing, they, they also have the story down about, well, Building 7 wasn't hit by a plane, but it was damaged from the collapse of the towers, and that's why it collapsed, and yet it's still standing there. And then about five or six minutes before Building 7 would have collapsed through the window behind her, uh, the connection from London to New York goes a bit fuzzy and she disappears. Strange. What's even more bizarre is the BBC's response to this and the website that had hosted this clip's response. Um, Janice Matthews, the executive director of 911truth.org, and I wanted to confirm the authenticity of the tape. So I found an XML file in the same directory as the video, which basically gave the timestamp of GMT, which correlated to the correct time, so it was live, it wasn't them showing the footage on blue screen with her standing there. 
We also contacted archive.org, which had listed this archive, and wanted to confirm the authenticity. And basically, after they responded to us, archive.org started to pull all of their 9-11 news footage that they had been hosting, and they basically explained it away that this was just a test. It wasn't supposed to be live, which I felt strange because it, it worked very well. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I want to touch on the media a little bit, too. You know, my experience with Scarborough Country, um, you know, I had asked them to show the clip of Building 7, and if you saw the clip that they showed, for whatever reason, NBC, which shot that footage, couldn't come up with better footage than I was able to get off TV. Their footage is blurred, the contrast is adjusted, so you really can't see the detail of uh, the explosives going off, going up the face of the building. Uh, but they did air it. Uh, which was maybe one of the first times that they ever aired the clip of Building 7. When I was subsequently asked to be on the Glenn Beck show by Headline News, and I asked them, you know, would you play the clip of Building 7? Look, and MSNBC played it. Uh, the booking agent for the show said she'd have to get back to me, and when she got back to me, she said, no, no, we're not going to show the clip of Building 7. And she said, well, is that a deal breaker? And I said, yeah, that's a deal breaker. You want me to go on national television to talk about 9-11 conspiracy theories, but you won't show a clip of this building that wasn't hit by a plane that fell that day. Now, why won't you show that clip? Why is the media not willing to show that clip if there's nothing to hide? If there's nothing unusual about it, why won't they show it? Oh, and by the way, NIST is supposed to release the final report explaining the collapse of that building this month. They've postponed it many times. One would think with the scale of such a disaster, an engineering disaster, with how many people working with the high-rise buildings in this country, they want to know why these buildings fell down the way they did, so that it doesn't ever happen again. I mean, granted, the building was on fire, it was damaged, and yet, the building doesn't fall in the direction of the damage, it doesn't fall in the direction where you can see the structure collapse based on their own report and the video, uh, which is quite strange. So CNN's response when I said, why won't you show this footage? You know what they said? We have a policy against showing collapsing buildings. <laughs> and I thought they were joking. I, I said, you're kidding, right? And Joe, no, this is very serious, Mr. Burger. I said, you have a policy against showing collapsing buildings? They said, policy the I guess so. I said, well, it was in effect on September 11th. Well, it wasn't going to be in effect six weeks you know, 10 weeks later. So I said, well, well, who made up this policy? And she was, well, the producer told me that's our policy. Well, can I talk to the producer? Uh, no, the producer won't come to the phone. And I said, well, I guess I'll just have to quote you. And she said, oh, no, you can't quote me. I'll lose my job. And I said, I don't get paid to do this. Um, you're going to need to give me somebody at CNN who's going to take responsibility for this policy. And she said, well, why don't you call the CEO? And I said, okay, I'll hold. And she said, well, I can't get the CEO. Guess why? Guess I can't either. And she said, well, give me an hour. I'll find you somebody. And she called me back in an hour. And she said, why don't you call Janine Iamuno? She does uh, public relations for Headline News. So I called Janine right away. And Janine said, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm going to have to get back to you. And later that day, I get an email from Janine. I'm sure it was written by the legal department at Headline News. And it literally, she said, this is what we're offering at this time. CNN vets using footage of 9-11 on a case-by-case -case basis, but we do not have a policy against showing collapsing buildings. So uh, when people ask me well, if this stuff is all true, why won't the media cover it? Uh, I think Building 7 is the perfect example to give. Why won't the media cover it? Now, Paul Thompson has assembled an enormous collection of cooperative research. It's been published in a book, The Terror Timeline, of mainstream media articles that challenge the story. And yet, to this day, not a single media outlet has ever assembled these contradictions into a coherent story that challenged what was published by the 9-11 Commission or what's come you know, by the American people. So you know, one other and additional glaring example of foreword of the printed version of the Terror Time, I'll give a foreword uh, by Peter Lance, where one of the news pieces that Paul Thompson had dug up happened to be about the two fighters.